This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description. A practical prayer is a prayer that works. These discussions between Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence dive into the details of how it works and how to work it. Reverend Bill is a New Thought minister and the author of Practical Prayer for Real Results. Your new life begins with a new thought. Carol Lawrence is on a spiritual quest, finding the New Thought teaching after decades on the pulpit in three different traditional denominations. I've got some questions. Together, they're exploring the philosophy and activities that come together from many of the world's religions to create the practical spirituality that is New Thought. Welcome to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. And uh, talk I can't about wait to evolution. Get into yeah, yeah. yeah. Evolution. So, so here's what I'm so anxious. You, you want to say something? I'm so anxious to no. jump right in because this thing has been on my mind. Um, on your market you know, side. It, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not the evolution of humankind, you know, that... Like like Darwin and all that stuff. I'm not because you knew darn well I would start talking about creation stories as soon as you brought that up. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. Okay, well it ain't that. <laughs> it's what okay. it's what we're going through. And let me say this: I um, this is what kicked it off in my head. I had a conversation recently with a bishop, highly respected highly successful in the traditional church. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we talk every now and then about stuff. And let me see how to say this. They were explaining to me their forward motion in terms of vision and okay. so forth. How, how their particular denomination is going to move ahead? To turn into something new? Yeah. Well, in their yeah, their smaller particular pastoral space. And um, it's it's a significant um size church. Really yeah. significant. And and I'm thinking, as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, I ain't God, but I'm not sure this is gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> Really, and I'm very, um, you know, cautious about about that because I'm not God. But anyway, um, here's here's what made me think, and I'm going to use the pandemic as a kickoff point. Okay, Ta everything changes, and uh, if you're a baby boomer, the baby boomer culture seemed to last a really, really long time, but nevertheless. Culture changes over time. I don't know if it's a particular event that changes it or whatever, but I feel like the pandemic was a really point of change in so many ways, particularly in the traditional church. And I'm yet to understand or get a full uh, scope of New Thought churches or New Thought uh, spiritual centers. So I can't say anything about that, but. I do know the traditional church really well, mm -hmm. and I under I could see the pattern of changes that were affected uh, by the or were an effect of the pandemic. Yep. So when someone shares with me a dream or a vision, a lot of people do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> it it kind of um, I kind of. Think of it in terms of juxtaposed to the change that was brought about by the pandemic. And I started to think about evolution and cultural evolution. Okay. And then I thought, you know, this is a little different. This might be like consciousness evolution. Okay. And I thought about Barbara Marks Hubbard, who talks a bit about um, co um, collective consciousness and yep. how it changes the culture and all of that. And I'm thinking like, how can we not consider that in where we are right now? Like we're what, four years past the pandemic? Not no. totally four years out of it. 
Right. But four, four and a half years, years since it started. Since it started, yeah. So we're we're definitely feeling still that turning point. Uh, that how I see it in some sense, in some ways, a turning point. And I'm wondering if that was a, if I could put the label of a consciousness evolution. There were a lot of changes, a yeah. lot of changes, but cultural we were, changes, yes. We were, we and were consciousness forced. Changes. We were forced to to a a, a change in consciousness. It changed a, a lot of assumptions. It changed mm-hmm. a lot of behaviors. It kicked the legs out from under a lot of stuff that we just assumed was, you know, baked in. And we either got to or had to reinvent a lot of stuff based on the fact mm-hmm. that the those previous assumptions were no longer necessarily the case. So, yeah, I'm completely with you. There's a lot of talk recently about the global supply chain because people used to think, oh, it doesn't matter where your factory is. There's, you know, global manufacturing and there's global shipping and there's global trade. And you just, you know, you source your thing from wherever you're going to source it and it shows up on time, Mm -hmm. you know, and then that stopped working. And then, you know, some of the partners aren't playing by the same rules that they used to because, you know, the the countries that have a lot of manufacturing capability for a certain thing want to do it a particular way. So now there's rethinking in that. And there's there was an evolution in thinking and in practice that got us into the global supply chain. And there's a a further evolution and shift in thinking that's moving us to the post global supply chain um, is sort of reset. And I'm not going to say that one of them was wrong and one of them was right. It's just hmm. one of them was right then and the other one was something else is right now. And that's what evolution is. It's 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 going with what's right now rather than insisting that what used to be got, got to stay because I liked it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's – I actually, I didn't think about uh, – you explained it in, in a different context and a little more detail than I um, would have if I thought <laughs> over that side <laughs> in, in that way. <laughs> but – it's not about right. It's about what is. Yeah. You know, because there's so many times that the culture has changed in so many ways. And this, the pandemic, I keep using that as, as a point. It was a huge uh, shift. For us to, yeah. It, and it changed so, so very much. Yep. And um, I've read, you know, I mean, history tells us about changes, but this one I just you know, like happened to experience. And right here, thinking no matter how much something makes sense it's not going to be ever like it was right and i don't think you can make it be like it was i think if we are you know if i i feel privileged to be on the planet still and because of that i'm very at- intense intentional about looking at things because i feel privileged to see the change and how do we navigate through it with the least amount of trauma, emotional trauma and other types? And I think we need, you know, it's worth taking our time to, you use the word, uh, there was a reword you used that I noted here, <laughs> reinvent <laughs> um, or reassess. But I think it's like reinventing because the world is different. Yeah, you know, I mean, on a very personal level, there were things that I had in hot motion <laughs> before the pandemic, and bang, okay, so I did a quick reset. Now that's not all that hard for me because I'm about reset, reinvent, and oh yeah, recover. well there's a and, lot you know, of anyway. plans, a lot of plans got changed. I you know was working in technology right through the end of 2019. And then um, put my full-time uh, attention into ministry. And I had a bunch of really good ideas. I went to the Bridal Expo in January of 2020. And I started meeting all the, the venues and vendors and you know, getting myself out there as a wedding celebrant. And mm-hmm. um, I had this notion of doing spiritual adventures, which is ex- physical experiential activities that give have a metaphysical message, which is what I did with teen groups for a long time, because you can get a really profound spiritual experience, for example, by walking on a balance beam and uh, having people around you perform some nonsense um, that really 
lets you embody the spiritual teaching. So I had myself set up. We had three sessions scheduled for a yoga studio. We were going to go in and get the group together and do spiritual adventures. And the first one was in May of 2020. And of course, <laughs> I had to cancel that one because the yoga studio was closed. And by the time we got to the second one, the yoga studio had been sold. <laughs> <laughs> they moved out of the space. Mm. You know, they went all online. And when they came back, it's like, yeah, we want to do yoga together. We're really not interested in doing these ancillary things. So it's going to take a while to build back up to that because there's still the celebration of, oh, we're able to do things that we used to take for granted, you know, in, in, a, in a new context. And I get it. So there was a certain amount of reinvention that happened for me as well. Turns out, fortunately, I'm really good with technology and other ministers are not. So I've been mm. able to, to, to do a lot of work with other ministries, helping them with the technology. And, and I think that's, um, that's a point that's really worth looking at, because when you, we get to these door, these changes, these points of change, forces us to use maybe skills that we take for granted or, or didn't use or didn't see that it was important. Now, that skill that you talked about, hugely, hugely important in the traditional church. Mm -hmm. um, it, it may not take off the way it, in my opinion, <laughs> ought to. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I one thing I do, one thing I know is that it ain't going back the way it was. True. So get on board and let's understand where it is and how to navigate where it is. Yep, that's that's evolution. Version. That is the evolution of our lives. So I'm really interested in this. You don't have to like share anybody's secret. What's the sort of thing that the bishop that the bishop wants to do? Where you're going? I don't know. Uh, to the uh, a huge. They already have a huge facility, beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's another one that's about four times as large. Now, listen. <laughs> okay, listen. If I'm not a mathematician, but I can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, do some percentages, and they, you ain't gonna steal my money. Okay. I'm pretty good with that much. Okay, you, you understand if the bottom you, line. If if the congregational attendance has declined enormously. For everybody, across the board, doesn't matter how, whatever, across the board. What about that suggests you should buy a space four times larger than the one you're in right now? <laughs> I, I don't get it. And, <laughs> and I'm saying, I, listen, I'm, I am humbly asking this question because, yep. like I said, I'm, I'm my God, I don't know. And that's another subject I know, okay? I am God, yeah. <laughs> but I just, I wish I could understand that. And I think I'm wrestling with it so much because the person, I've admired their progress for so many years. Um, I don't know if you're really being realistic about this. And, and there's other things going on with all of us, with this change, you know, you have dreams that you had uh, and it doesn't even depend on the pandemic. You have dreams that you've had and mm -hmm. time changes. Da, 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 the dream is, might be time for a new dream. I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. And it, but what comes to my mind as you're describing this, and this is the sort of thing that, you know, a lot of ministers that I work with and myself included are talking about is, um, what does growth look like? What does success look like? What is the metric that they that we want to use for saying this is this is how I'm growing? You know, mm -hmm. and as far as churches are concerned, it's always been you know how big is the how big is the building, and how many people do you put into the building, and are you doing two services or three services on Sunday morning? And for the longest time, there was a direct correlation between the size of the facility, the number of people in the facility, and the amount of revenue that the, the that the organization was generating. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, that winds up being a whole business thing. But you know, the fact of the matter is, there's it, it's free admission. 
So every one of those seats is free, and you, they pass the, the, the basket around, and some people put in 10% of their weekly income, and other people don't put in anything, and the rest of them are somewhere in between. Well, you know, if, if you get the statisticians and they said, well, <laughs> let's just get the people who are putting in 10% of the weekly income and let everybody else stay home. We can do it with a smaller group and get much nicer bagels. <laughs> but that's not the point. It's not a revenue generating operation. So that's the big question that I would ask your bishop friend is once it's successful, once the bishop has exactly the result that they're looking for. What's that look like? What is it? What's the metric? Is it more people who are spiritually fed? Is it more more butts in the seats? Is it a bigger offering basket? And you know, I'm, we're, I'm, this is inside baseball for people who are in the spiritual business. But the same thing applies for everybody. When you are setting an intention, when any of us are setting an intention for a new experience we want to have, let's call it a past assumptions. Once I have this, then that automatically means I'll have that. I was in the marketing business for a long time. People would say, I need a brochure. It's like, great. Uh, we know how to do brochures. Why do you need a brochure? Well, because the guy down the street has a brochure, and he has five times the business that I do. It's like, ah, great. Okay. So if you could have five times the business without a brochure, would that be good? Oh, sure. Okay. So you came in telling me you wanted a brochure. We're not three minutes into the conversation, and you no longer want a brochure. <laughs> you want whatever the brochure what you, what you assumed the brochure was going to bring you. Yes. And as we dig into that in so many ways, as we are setting the intention for the next experience we want to have, we're using the nouns about what we're going to get, what we're going to have, what we want to have. You know, Let me get the, this thing because that's going to give me the experience that I want. And the noun is, is implying the verb, and that's implying the feeling that we're going to have. So let's, let's go to the feeling. What does it look like to be successful doing this and let the rest I, of it get out of the way? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where practical prayer has been helpful to me in, uh, cause I look at it like not something you do, but something that you live. So mm -hmm. I may grab part of it, you know, to help me understand the relevance of where I am at this moment with something. So that's how I use it. Um, you say, what is the experience that I want to have? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, you know, even with me, because I mean, I had, I had a plan. Mm -hmm. I had a plan. And, <laughs> yeah. And I had to re-examine it many times. What is the impact I'm really after? Yeah. You know, it, if you're after a buck, that's easy because it's easy to figure out how to make some money. You know, you oh, can it's step really outside. It's really easy to know when you succeed it because you, you have the money. You have the money. But is that the impact that you're really after? And when you, dis when you identify what it is that you want and you said the feeling, or then that kind of determines what you're going to do to get to that. And if that doing is foreign to what you're accustomed to, you take a deep breath and say, what? am I supposed to do now? Mm. You know, and it, and it brings up a whole lot of stuff. It, it, my, do I have the courage to change it? Um, I'm very fortunate. I don't have to worry about competition <laughs> and <laughs> people looking at me and I got to do better than that. I don't really, I never cared about that ever, but I'm so free now that I'm, oh, yeah. I can ask that question that, that you Pose a lot. What's the feeling you want to have? Yeah. And I can take a day or two to figure it out. I don't have to do anything until I figure it out because I answer to me. Yeah. Now that's and, the worst one to answer to, but still. <laughs> well, you could be your, your that can be your har harshest critic, um, but you're also in a, a, an interesting position. Suddenly, thirty five, forty years in. Uh, in that you are a um, wise and um, thoughtful metaphysician with a rather significant Christian following. And the needle that you're threading is how do you share these metaphysical ideas uh, with people who are yearning for them, but who, if you just tell them, <laughs> are going to get scared away because you're not including <laughs> en enough of the stuff that they're used to. <laughs> Yeah, and, and um, 
I think that, you know, I, I'm big on looking at your life as a whole. You know, why did I go through 30 years of that or 35 years of that? Um, come on, Lawrence, why do you, you know, and I said, God, what, what's all that? About? It's not like you didn't have something else I could do to. And so then I start to look at what I gained from that and said, OK, so I use that now. All of these things, I use this now, and I have a new way to interpret it. So it becomes so completely fun for me. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything soars, you know? No, that, that. no. There are times when I go look up scripture so that I can talk about it from a metaph metaphysical perspective. And I got to figure that you probably don't have to because you know it well enough that you might go double check it, but you know what it says. So mm -hmm. somewhere in that 30, 35, or however, 60 years <laughs> of experience that you had, <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. there's, there's, there's some value that's, that, that, that's in there. There's something going on in there that wouldn't have been available otherwise. So, you know, it's worth celebrating, noticing and celebrating that. And the fact of the matter is, I've, I've said this before, that if I had done this podcast with somebody else who was in the same lane uh, and had the same spiritual background that I did, we would have done a dozen episodes and run out of stuff to talk about. But because you have the perspective that you do, we're at 160 something and going strong. Speaking of which, uh, let's take a break. <laughs> and yeah, there's, and there's, there's no uh, uh, no idea that you're going to be letting your foot off the, the gas anytime soon. <laughs> Keep on coming up with stuff. Let's take a break and continue the conversation about uh, assuming and evolution. Learn to put practical prayer to work in your life. The steps are simple to learn and let you begin to get real results to create the life of your dreams immediately. Reverend Bill Marcioni's widely acclaimed book, Practical Prayer for Real Results, gives you a clear summary of the new thought principles behind practical prayer and the series of easy-to-understand steps found in the most effective prayers from religions and spiritual practices all over the world and throughout history. Practical prayer is not a replacement for your religion or practice. It's a technique to make the work you do in consciousness even more effective. The book includes 40 prayers on various topics that you can adapt as needed and use as your own. Practical Prayer for Real Results is available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook on Amazon or at b-the-light.com. That's b-the-light.com. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. We were talking today about evolution and the way things change uh, as time unfolds. And it's not evolution as in Darwin's evolution and uh, everything that's happened since the Big Bang. It's the evolution and the changing and the shift in our thinking and in our experience. And the story that I wanted to bring up is uh, one of my mentors is uh, Michael Beckwith. And some number of years ago, they had been meeting in this converted warehouse space in Culver City, California. And it was, they had outgrown it, and it was time to move into a different space, even though it was a, you know, very nicely uh, appointed, um, you know, large. It's just, it, they, 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 they needed more elbow room. And he had wanted a bigger space and been going through this whole thing personally himself. And then finally, he said, you know what? I don't have an edifice complex, I don't need a building. I want to. I want to have an experience. I want to be able to get a lot of people together. It doesn't need to be mine. It doesn't need to have my steeple on top. And since then, they've been meeting in uh, a converted movie theater. Uh, actually, I guess a, a, a real theater uh, in Beverly Hills. And they got some small offices upstairs, but they're sharing the space. You know, they got the oldie shows that are in there on Saturday night, and then they do their church services on Sunday morning. He doesn't need that huge space all week long. He just wants to have enough room for his folks to get in on Sunday morning. And that's the same evolution that you're talking about is instead of thinking I need to have this, your you know, your colleague 
the bishop who needs to have a 4,000 or an 8,000 or a 16,000 seat venue for some purpose is like, let go of the venue. What's the experience that I want to have? What's that tone and flavor that I want to be experiencing? And what is it that I want to be sharing? And that's the evolution. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a way to share that, to have that same tone and flavor and experience without the mortar and the mortgage. Absolutely. And there's, I use the word freedom a lot because um, you can do so much more and God can flow, the spirit can flow through you so much more if you don't have the encumbrances that, that we put on ourselves, really. Mm -hmm. um, and my, there, in, in my experience, I've often been amazed at what has come out of the letting go of an idea or a belief, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what else am I holding on to? <laughs> <laughs> but There's a you, quick, easy you answer to what you're holding on to. Everything. Yeah. 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 You know, and yeah. that's the same. It's not you. I'm not singling you out. That's what we're all doing. We are all holding on to every assumption, every experience that we've had, that it's going to keep going the way that it's going, that it's going to keep working the way that it's been working, that we're going to keep being disadvantaged um, or struggling the way that we've been struggling. That's the assumption. That's not necessarily true. It can, it's all subject to change. But are you, you know, are we open? And that's the question that we would ask ourselves. Are we open to this change? Or what does this change mean? Or what is this change saying to me, you know, what do I have to do with it? And I'm going, you're the one that brought up the 30 years I was in this thing. And then you said 60. <laughs> and my, my mind, my mind went back to, oh, my goodness, it was 40. Oh, no, it was 40 something years back. And I had stayed late for work one night. My intent was to just get this stuff done. It was in corporate America at that time, having a wonderful time there. And uh, a young man came up to me at the copy machine <laughs> in the old days, the copy machine. Oh yeah. And, you know, he, I, he just stood there and looked at me and I'm thinking, please don't say anything. I, I can get this, <laughs> I can get this done. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, I don't even care who you are really right now. And I happened to look at him and he was, he was crying. And I'm thinking, what? I got to get, I got to have this ready by 7.30 in the morning, you know. And there's somebody and crying said, at the copy machine. Yeah. And he said, um, I want to talk to you. I said, okay, you know, what's, what's wrong? And he said, uh, you know God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're buddies. Like, who told you that? But anyway, he said, you know God. And fast forward, um, his, his lifestyle was a little bit different. And he wanted to know if God hated him. And I'm thinking, I don't think so, but, you know, like right now, really? <laughs> and I stopped because I saw his eyes. I saw the tears in his eyes. And that to me was a moment of change. Like the pendulum had stopped mm -hmm. because I had one thought. And I don't know that I examined my own thoughts about it, but I had to because this was a moment. Somebody was really hurt, and I couldn't put just an, an, an ad, uh, you know, a feeling on it or an interpretation. It, it was different. This, this person was hurt, and I stopped. And I had to re-examine everything that I had been told and blah, 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 mm -hmm. just because one person stood there and asked me, and I think about how many answers I could have given and quick got the person off my back so I could get my work done. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know. In including the pat answer from, from the religions that you then went to pastor in. Absolutely. Which and I would I guess thought, you, didn't, you didn't give. No, I didn't. How can you, <laughs> you know, how can you when somebody is, you see hurt in their eyes and that's just one experience. Like that one experience of seeing hurt in his eyes is seeing hurt in a community, in an experience of people collectively. You've got to stop and rethink what you 
thought about it and what does this mean for you going forward? You know, all right. And once I figured out, <laughs> it was real quick too, that I didn't think what anybody else thinks, because I would not think consciously think of something that would bring a person to tears and talk to another person that's really a stranger mm-hmm. and doesn't look anything like you. Get it? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> I'm thinking, I, I couldn't even think why me. Like this was supposed to happen and I'm the one who's supposed to get this straight in my mind for some reason. And I did that, you know, and that's what I think these big moments of difference are saying to us. You know, I'm not saying God is saying it or spirit is moving. I'm saying when we encounter these strong moments of change, it's not for nothing. You know, I'm here like 60 years, 40 years after that original experience. I could be gone. I'm still here. That happened for a, for something. And, and you along have no the way, idea what his trajectory has been since then. That was a deflection point in his life. I mean, to get to the point where he's talking to a stranger at the copying machine with tears in his eyes, looking for absolution and getting confirmation that he's a valuable, worthwhile, important human being, regardless of the stories that other people have convinced him he has to tell about himself. It's magical. It it is, and and I'm not taking any credit for you know anything deep. He said, "You changed my life," and we went on to work together for years after that. So I know he was telling the truth. Yeah. Um, but I'll never. To me, I don't see it as like, oh, I changed him. I came to a point where I had to face what I thought that would have an effect on other people that I encounter mm-hmm. forever. Yep. You know, forever. Yep. And um, it, that's where we all face with big changes, you know, big stuff that's outside of ourselves. If I didn't meet him, so what? You know, like I'm cool the way I am. I wouldn't have ever been challenged by it. But, you know, the pandemic is the same thing. We have been challenged to change the way we've been doing things and thinking about things. Yeah. And and that's, you know, it's not a pandemic s- discussion. I'm sorry. It's just, I use that as a reference point. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, exp- a collective experience of, of change, of transformation. That was a disruption that everybody had at the same time uh, for the same reason. And at the risk of actually doubling back and and the episode where we began, which we so rarely do, talking about evolution and your bishop friend who wants to quadruple the size of the auditorium. If the ministry is about being that healing presence of bringing an awareness of love and light and compassion to one person who's in tears at the copy machine, how does the 10,000-seat auditorium support that? Or is there an assumption in there that things have to be the way that they've been? What's, what's, what is our purpose? What is our goal? What is it that we want to have happen? If I share my gifts and skills and talents in a way that brings as much good into my life and to my family and to my community and my world as is possible, what's that look like? What does that look like? For some people, what it looks like is get out of the way. There are other people with wonderful ideas that are ready to jump in and do the work and make the change. And the only thing that's keeping them from being able to do that is somebody standing away saying, this is the way we've always done it. I'm in charge and you got to do it my way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had bosses who said my way or the highway. And I was like, bye. (laughs) (laughs) And you could, you know, there, there was that freedom inside of you that allowed you to do that. Everybody doesn't have that. Oh, sometimes it was traumatic. It wasn't, it's not a built in. That was easy to do. (laughs) Well, you know, look, we we get faced with uh, questions and opportunities to make changes, and you know, I'm a I use the word freedom a lot. Do you feel free to do mm-hmm. that, unafraid of what might happen? I, I'm very sensitive to where the bishop is going and what the bishop wants to do. I know that vision from many years ago. 
uh, when it was shared with me. But I have a sensitivity, I think, about where we are now collectively. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's a different way that you can meet those goals. And, you know, it's going to mean changing a lot within, which is a whole nother subject. But that's, you know, that's, that's where it starts, right? Oh, yeah. And that's actually where this whole thing is heading, because the conversation with the bishop is, are you willing to let go of this preconceived notion and make room for something different? So let's take mm -hmm. another break, and then we're going to do a prayer for everybody who is listening to this. And the prayer is about letting go. Is Reverend Bill letting you know that the Practical Prayer for Real Results class is now available on demand. That's right. You can take it at your own pace anytime you want. All of the information is at BeTheLight.com. That's B-The-Light.com. You know where to find that stuff. The class is five lessons broken down into 18 modules, and you can take them at whatever pace is comfortable for you. As you work through the process, it starts out with the theory, goes into the practice. There are experiential activities and exercises. And at the end of the program, you will wind up with an understanding of how practical prayer works and a practical prayer for yourself that will work to create transformation in your life. And as you know, it works for everything. Take a look at the class online at BeTheLight.com. There's a sample lesson so you can see how the class is going to work for you and then dive in. The great news is it's on sale now. You can register and save $20 off of the regular price. I'm looking forward to seeing you in class. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol, here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. We have been having a wonderful conversation about personal evolution and moving from the experience that we used to be having to the next experience that we're going to be having. And some of us are very graceful about that. And some of us uh, clench onto old experiences with our iron grip, <laughs> refusing to let go because it would either what's been going on before has been working really well or because it's been going how it's been going but we're terrified of having it be different because then there's a whole area that we don't know about mm -hmm. so the prayer today is about the willingness to let go to be a participant in transformation and there's a wonderful visual of the trapeze artists swinging back and forth high above the floor of the circus and they're swinging back and forth and there's the trapeze artist and there's the catcher and the one they're swinging and they're swinging and as long as they continue swinging it's just a couple of people swinging back and forth the thing that makes it spectacular is when the trapeze artists let go they let go and they do the somersault and the twirl and the tumble and then something's gonna happen there is something gonna happen next but until they let go of the bar nothing happens that is such a wonderful reminder of how our lives and our experiences are evolving. Something is going to happen. Something is going to be different. And there's guidance that's available to us that lets us know that this is the right time. This is the moment to make a move. It is okay. It is safe. It is at least reasonable for me to take this move. But when it comes along, everything that's come up until that moment, everything that we've assumed so far, comes into question and it is the opportunity for us to let go and doing that from our small self from the part of us that's just observing the world around us it can be terrifying it can be terrifying in the olympics there are people who do spectacular dives off of a 10 meter platform that's 33 feet in the air 39 feet in the air just jumping off of one of those things is terrifying and here they are doing acrobatics and in order to get into that ability, the fear needs to be released, to let go of that, to make room for the artistry, the performance, the success, the joy, the competitiveness, and the gold medal. There is a need to let go of, I've never done this before. There is that requirement that we release whatever has led up until this particular time so that we can allow something new to come in. And we have a partner in that. 
there is an infinite creative power. There is one source which shares itself as all of its creation. It's God or nature or spirit, big sweetie, the big bang, whatever it is we want to call it. There is that one source from which everything has been evolving since the very beginning of time. That evolution includes everything, everyone, everywhere, every planet, every particle, every person, everything is that one taking its own particular form. And this next experience of evolution for each of us is the way that divine presence shares itself even more richly and deeply and fully and joyously as us. Not for us. It's not a gift being handed to us. We get to do the letting go. We get to release our attachment to things being the way that they have been. We get to open to that newness. We need to release the safety of holding on to the trapeze bar and allow ourselves to be cast into new possibilities. So it is with faith and intention and knowing that we allow ourselves to let go, to invite in something new, to set the intention for not the result that we want to have, but the experience and the tone and the texture and the flavor. A gold medal, maybe. Being safely caught, maybe. Applause, maybe. A safe landing in the net below, maybe. Being able to go back home afterwards and tell a story, maybe. The experience that we are seeking is different for each of us. Success is different for each of us. And as we let go of the specifics of what that success looks like and allow ourselves to open to the flavor and the tone, the feeling, the nuance of what that experience brings to us, as we invite and embody that new feeling, that infinite creative power that creates everything is partnering with us to create this newness. The guidance, the timing, the ability is all the divine presence sharing itself in a new way. And each of us is participating in that creation. And so the good is unfolding. It's different for everyone within the sound of my voice. It's different for all of us, but the same process for everyone. This is how that infinite creative power is already responding, sharing itself as good and more good and more good for and through and as each of us. I am so grateful for it. I'm grateful for the good. I'm grateful for the awareness of the process. I'm grateful for the willingness of each one here to let go and open to something new and wonderful. And so with gratitude for all of this good and looking forward to the delightful stories that we all get to tell, I speak this word and I release it into that same creative law setting an intention for this newness now, and I know it's already unfolding. And so I let it be. And so it is. The Practical Prayer Podcast with Rev. Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence is a production of BeTheLight.com. Be-the-light.com. Where you can find more information about practical prayer for real results. Our theme is by Music of Wisdom. You can learn about the spiritual community of New Thought Philadelphia with daily guided meditations, weekly celebrations of spirit, and Rev. Bill's classes in practical spirituality at NewThoughtPhilly.org. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description.